Turn with me to the epistle of James, chapter 3, verse number 5. We are back to the subject of controlling our tongues. Now let me ask you, who, when growing up as a kid, ever heard something like this? If I ever hear that word come out of your mouth again, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. Now, I am pretty sure that happened to me. But it didn't happen for mom and dad. I have a, a faint memory of either Mama or Papa Harry in that little bathroom. I didn't say something. And I got the soap. And it's just a vague memory. But I'm sure that kids don't even hear anything like that in today's ever secularizing society. But back in the days when a sense of Christian morality had an actual meaningful influence on our society, back in those days, having pure speech was something that was important in a whole lot more people's lives than it is in our culture and in society today. And it was certainly important to James. Because in the verses that we have before us this morning, he's going to give us the most definitive passage in all of the Bible in regards to pure speech. The issue was obviously very important to James because he understood, as the half-brother of Jesus, that it was also very important to Jesus. And we saw that last week. Remember Matthew 12, verse 36, where Jesus says this, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. And I want you to notice, notice that's not just evil words, but idle words. Careless words, words that so serve no good positive purpose. As we learned last time, your speech is such a revealer of your heart, of what's on the inside. And part of what regeneration produces in a person is a change in your speech. It doesn't become perfect. Understand that, because nothing becomes perfect in our lives in this life until we get over heaven. But it definitely changes after you come to faith in Christ. And as a side note, as you grow in your Christian faith, your vocabulary, especially if you're in a good, sound doctrine church, your vocabulary expands, especially theologically, so that if you could go back and talk to your old self before you came to Christ about theology and biblical concepts, your old self might as well be listening to Chinese. And that's definitely the truth in my case. I mean, I wouldn't be able to carry a conversation on with those concepts with my old self as far as biblical terms are concerned. Christians talk differently than other people. Not perfect. Understand that. But certainly different. Paul explains that in Colossians chapter 3. In verse number 3, look what he says. For you, Christian, have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen. There's been a change. The point is, a new heart 
produces new behavior, and that new behavior also involves new speech. Again, this is another test that James is giving us in order for us to be able to determine the genuineness of our faith. But you have to understand that salvation, regeneration, the new birth, it's all totally and completely a work of God. He's the one that draws. He's the one that regenerates. He's the one that grants the gifts of repentance and faith. And once that happens, and we then enter into this new life, we don't just sit back and say, well, God, I'm a new creation. So just get to work. I'm sure all this is just going to happen by itself. Now, God does say you're a, a new creation. And he does say it will all take place. But not by itself. It will all take place through your spirit energized commitment. You and your will and your actions come into play energized by the working of the Spirit in your life. Both of those things are in play at the same time. That's sanctification 101 right there. Remember we studied at the end of Philippians 2 verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's us. That's our part. Next verse, verse 13. Or, at the same time, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And you have to work just to keep a balanced perspective between those two realities. And so while this passage is a statement on the character of genuine saving faith as revealed by our speech at the same time, it is also a call for us to correct our speech because those two things go hand in hand. This is something that will be true of us and at the same time, it will always be something that we have to work at. Both of those things are true because our flesh will be with us until our very last breath. Think of it this way. What God says will be true of us also must be true of us. You understand that? God takes care of the will be. And we, in submission to his power, take care of the must be. Both those things happen at the same time. There's a divine tension there that will happen in your life all the way to the end. So, in this chapter, knowing that, James lays out five compelling reasons for controlling our tongue. And we looked at the first two last time. First, we saw already its potential to condemn. Look at verses 1 and 2. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter Judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And there James says the tongue has tremendous potential to bring judgment, and he uses teachers as his illustration. He's saying, don't be in a hurry to go into the preaching and teaching ministry because you're going to be using your tongue when you do that, which has so much potential to condemn you. Now, he's not against the called and the gifted being teachers in the church. We've got to have them, but his emphasis is on how serious a task it is to teach the Word of God and the potential of the tongue to go into error when you do. When I turn on the TV, when I scan the internet, one thing is for sure. We have too many 
Bible teachers. We got way too many. And those who shouldn't be Bible teachers seem to far outnumber those who should be. What we need more of are sound Bible expositors and way less of the rest that we see. Now, secondly, we learn that the tongue must be controlled because of its power to control. In verses 3 to 5, remember last week, he used the illustrations of the bits that were put in the horse's mouth that, that make them obey us and we can control them whatever way we want to go control their whole body, and then the large ships in the sea, even when it's windy conditions, the little rudder controls the whole ship. And so James is saying the tongue is a small part of our body, but it has tremendous power to control all the rest of us. Remember, you sin with your tongue more frequently than any other part of your body. Think about this. You can't do everything that you might want to do that's wrong because circumstances might prevent you from doing something that's wrong. You're just not able to do it, but you can say anything you want to. You can say anything you want to anytime you want to. So we have to control our tongues because of its potential them and its power to control and now thirdly we're going to pick it up where we left off last time. Look at verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And this is an exclamation at the danger of the tongue. The contrast in this example is, is extremely vivid. Think about how one little cigarette flit into some dry conditions can actually set thousands of acres ablaze. Remember when that happened in Tennessee a couple of years back? Was it a campfire? I think it was a campfire where we go to the, the chimney tops that got it going. And I can remember we went like just a year after that massive fire in Gatlinburg and the, the effects of that fire, you could see them. The mountains were just scorched and buildings burned down and it started from a small little fire. Fire has a staggering capacity for destruction. Water can't multiply. What do I mean by that? Well, if you've got a cup of water and you take it and you pour it out on the ground, that's not going to start a flood. But if you have just one match, just one little match, you can burn a whole city down. Let me give you an example. In Chicago, on October the 8th, 1871, at approximately 8.30 p.m., a spark started in Mrs. O'Leary's barn. And before it was over, that one spark in Mrs. O'Leary's barn, barn burnt 17,500 buildings to the ground. 17,500 buildings. 300 people in the Great Fire in Chicago burned to death that night. 125,000 people were left utterly homeless as a result of that fire. And in 1871, they estimated the damage at $400 million in 1870. Boy, that's one spark. In 1903, a pan of rice boiled over onto a charcoal-fired stove in a small home in Korea. And before that little charcoal fire had done its damage, 3,000 Buildings were burned to the ground within a one square mile area. Everything was torched to the ground. So that illustrates the power of fire. 
And look what James says at the end of verse 5. See how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. And then in verse 6, he makes his point. Look at it. And the tongue is a fire. Proverbs 16, 27 says, A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. Everything his fiery mouth touches is set on fire, and the fire spreads. Proverbs 26, 20 says this, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisper, Contention quiets down. And the picture here is that the whisper, the gossip, that person that passes on the evil report, the slanderer, the one who, as Christie says, packs tales. It's like the wood that fuels the fire. In the next verse, look at verse 21, it says, in uh, Proverbs 26, like charcoal the hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The picture again is of, of gossip and slander and contention being, being a fire that devastates. The devastating power of a tongue, think about it, to start a rumor, to spread a lie about people that's evil in its intent. It's like a wildfire that can't be stopped once it starts. One writer said this, I am more deadly than the screaming shell from the howitzer. I win without killing. I tear down homes, break hearts, and wreck lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. No innocence is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard truth, no respect for justice, no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget and seldom forgive and my name is gossip. That's true. Isn't it? That's why Proverbs 10, 19 says where there are many words transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. So don't be the fuel for anybody's fire. Don't be the wood that keeps the fire going. Now look at that in verse 6. We have probably one of the strongest statements in the Bible on the danger of the mouth. Look what it says. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. And that's an interesting phrase. And the word for world there in the Greek is cosmos. And you know what that means. That means this evil world system. It is a cosmos of iniquity. Now there are four elements here I want you to see. Look at it. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Man, that is an overwhelming statement. It has four parts. I want to take you through them. These parts warn us about the peril of the tongue. Number one, it is a system of iniquity. Cosmos. It's an odd title for a tongue, right? It means, again, this world system of evil. James says here, look again in verse 6, the tongue is the very world of iniquity. What he's saying is, is that our tongue naturally is a sinful system. Our tongue is a, is a system of iniquity. Our tongue is an unrighteous, hostile, rebelling order within our humanness. And if you think about it, it really is the focal point of all behavioral unrighteousness in people. One commentator said this, it is the microcosm of evil among our members. No other bodily part has such far-reaching potential for disaster as the tongue. So indeed it is a system 
of iniquity. Now, secondly, it is also a network that breeds evil. Look next in verse 6. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. So let me tell you, it's also like smoke from a fire. It stains everything that it doesn't burn. Yesterday, me and Levi burned some limbs in the backyard. And if you had come by my house and wanted to pick me up and go somewhere without me changing my clothes, the instant that I got into your vehicle, you would have known what I was just doing. Because I would smell like the smoke of the limbs that we had burned. The tongue is not only a raging fire, what, what it can't consume, it'll stain with smoke. James says the tongue is set among our members. It's placed among our bodily parts. And he uses the word, look at it there, defiles. That's a strong word. It means to pollute. It means something that has been made evil or wretched. The tongue is that which defiles the entire body. What does that mean? The whole person. Defiles the whole person. So in your mouth, you have a system of a name that will stain and burn your whole person. And thirdly, look next in verse 6. And sets on fire the course of our life. So James just keeps expanding these points that he's making out bigger and bigger and bigger from their perspective. It sets a blaze. And the Greek right there is the circle of life, meaning the whole machinery of our life. It's not only a system of iniquity that stains you, but guess what else it does? It touches everything that you touch. It affects the whole machinery of your life. It goes beyond the body to touch every single participant who is existing in the, in the circle of your life. Your spheres of influence in your work, in your family. Guess what? People know you by how you talk. Right? Think about that. And the tongue reaches out to touch the whole network of people that are touched by you. Gossip, rumors, slander, false accusations, lies, evil speech can stain and pollute and destroy a whole faith, a whole group of people a whole church, a whole community. I mean, it is far reaching what the tongue has the capacity to do. But James isn't done. Fourthly, the most devastating statement on the danger of the tongue looked last week in verse 6. And is set on fire by hell. Man! And that's present tense. That means it's habitually being lit, as it were, by hell, it says. Now, a little background. The word hell here is Gehenna. This word is used only in the New Testament. It's used in all of the Gospels and only outside of the Gospels here. It only appears this one time outside of the Gospels. Jesus used the word Gehenna ten times. More than anybody else in the New Testament. And he always used this word, Gehenna, to refer to the eternal place of burning where damned souls will go when they die. You don't like that? Ooh, that sets you uh, sideways. You shouldn't be believing that in today's world of 2022. Too bad. Then you don't believe the Bible and you don't believe Jesus. And Jesus is a liar if you don't believe that. Period. He refers to it as the place where the fire never goes out, where the worm never dies, where the thirst is never quenched. Jesus is speaking very clearly there about hell. You can't get around that. It's not a subject we like to talk about. I can't wrap my mind around hell. I can wrap my mind around hell for child molesters and Hitler and people like that, sure. But I can't fully wrap my mind around hell. Why do I believe it? Why do I believe it's a real place? Because I believe in the authority of the word of 
God and main character in the Word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he went to great pains to warn us about it. And he used this word Gehenna for hell ten times in the New Testament. And that's why I believe it. Gehenna is translated hell in the New Testament. And guess what? Here's a little more background. It's also a place in Israel. If you were standing on top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem, looking south, there's a deep valley that goes straight down from a cliff, and it's called the Valley of Hinnom. Gehenna is the Valley of Hinnom. In 2 Kings, when King Josiah came along, one of the things that he first did was he abolished idolatry in the land. And one of the forms of idolatry that was taking place was human sacrifice. The worshippers of Moab would offer their children in the fire, literally burning them to death as they worship Moab. Moab was made into an image of a bull, and he had outstretched arms like this, and these people would lay their children on top of those arms in their worship service and burn those kids to death. Can you imagine watching and hearing that as it happened. We're talking about wickedness at the deepest level. Now Josiah comes in and he shut it all down. But all of that took place literally in the valley of Hinnom. And so going way back, the valley of Hinnom was a place of burning. And during that time, it was burning with the stench of the flesh of little children. And you don't like to hear that, but I'm telling you what was happening. That's what the Bible is telling us. That's real life. And so the Jews came to regard this place, this Gehenna, this valley of Hinnom, with deep hatred. And that's why later on, this area literally became the city dump of Jerusalem. That's what it was in Jesus' day. All the garbage of Jerusalem was dumped in Gehenna. All the bodies of dead animals were dumped in Gehenna. All of the criminals, the dead bodies of the criminals who had been executed, they would just throw them into the heat. That's what they were going to do with Jesus until Joseph of Arimathea stepped in. They would just pitch them in the, in the pile in Gehenna. And with all of that constantly being put in there, Garbage and dead bodies of animals and people. Gehenna became this place where the fire literally never went out 24 7, 365. It always stunk. And it always, and it became known as literally Gehenna of fire because the fire was always burning there. And so that's why Gehenna became a fitting symbol and the perfect illustration. For Jesus to use about hell when he was teaching the people there in first century Palestine. Only in the actual hell, Jesus said the fire never finally consumed. It just keeps on forever. So let's put this all together. James says that the tongue is a system of iniquity on its own, but its effects, it affects the whole person, and it sets its stain and its fire on the whole machinery of our life, and it is as far-reaching as the total network of every person that we come into contact with. And the thing that starts it all is set on fire, James says, by hell itself. In other words, behind it all is sin. That tongue that we have can be used and is used as a tool of sin to pollute your whole person, to corrupt your whole circle of life, and it comes right out of the pit of hell and it all leads right back to the pit of hell. Now that is quite a description from James. You think he's serious about the tongue? The peril of the tongue to corrupt is so 
dangerous. And that is why it has to be controlled. Because even with believers in our flesh, there still remains the power of the tongue to devastate. Your tongue, my tongue, is not yet glorified. One day it will be, but for now, we need to continually be at work to keep our Christian tongues under control. Now let's move next to some more illustrations. James just continues to do this in verses 7 and 8. For every species of beast and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. What he's saying here is that the tongue is untamable. It's uncivilized. It's undisciplined and humanly untamable. And that's why it's so dangerous. dangerous. And unregenerate tongues are all the more dangerous. And James says, God gave man the power to control animals. I mean, think about Noah's ability that he had. Wouldn't that have been something that was getting caught two by twos on that part? But I stay amazed at how lions and tigers can be tamed in the circus. Even more amazing to me is how they can tame and train killer whales to do the stuff that they do at SeaWorld. You've never seen that. Go on the internet and take a look at that. I mean, it's really incredible. And man has been doing that since the very beginning. But James says, no one among men can tame the tongue. No one has the power to do it. Again, even in believers, the tongue breaks out of its cage and we lose control of it. Now, please notice, James doesn't say it can't be tamed. He says man can't take. No one can take, meaning man. So who can? Well, God can. God can tame it by his power. Man without God's power cannot. And James says here in verse 8, look at it again. The tongue is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. It's always ready to break out. It, it fights against restraining itself. It, it doesn't want to be held back. It hears something. Oh, I got to say something about that. Don't you know you don't always need to say what needs to be said, even if you're right, right? Don't always need to say it. And lastly, the tongue is a hypocrite. Look at verse nine. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and we do as great we should. Regularly. Man, that's the best function of the tongue that we have. We bless the Lord and praise the Lord, but look next. And with it, we curse men. Same tongue. Who have been made in the likeness of God. And there's the duplicity, and there's the hypocrisy. The same tongue that blesses God curses those who are made in his image, slanders them. Criticizes them, accuses them, abuses them in anger, in jealousy, in envy, in hatred, in bitterness. To curse means to wish evil on somebody. And man is made in the image of God as we read at the very beginning of our service. The image was very severely marred in the fall, but still, what does it mean that man is made in the image of God? Well, man like God is rational. Man like God is personal. Man like God is moral. Man like God is self-conscious. Animals don't have that. Man can reason. Man can love. And he can act on the basis of rational thought and motive and intent. And that's what we mean when we say that man is made in the image of God. So how is it then that man can bless God? And curse man at the same time when man is made in the image of God. Verse 10. From the same mouth come both blessing and curse. That is so true. Do you really need me to give you an illustration for that? Hmm? I mean, we can all we can all provide our own illustrations, can't we? One by one. We'd be here the next Sunday. Went through all of them. But look next in verse 10. My brethren, these things ought not to be this 
words. Indeed. That's a strong phrase in the original Greek. That's not right. It isn't right at all. God has saved us. And when he did, he transformed us. And when he transformed us, he gave us a capacity for new speech. And guess what? He expects us to speak that way in our life. And next, as we close out for today, James gives us three illustrations. First of all, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? What's the answer? No. From the same opening, from the same hole, the same split in the rock, can fresh water and bitter water come out at the same time? No. That's impossible. That's very simple and easy to understand. Then verse 12. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives? Or a vine produce figs? No. A fig tree will never produce an olive. A vine will never produce a fig. And then comes the statement of fact that concludes the whole passage. Nor can salt water produce fresh. And notice with that one, that's not a question, is it? No. That's a conclusion. Nor can salt water produce flesh. And now, changes right back to where he started. True believers will be revealed in their speech. A clean heart can't produce bitter water. But wait a minute, brother Phil. My flesh struggles, and there is some bitter water that comes out of me alongside of the fresh. That's true. But still, what James is doing is he's giving us the gold standard. He's letting us know that it is a general truth that salt water can't come out of a fresh water. If you've been transformed by Christ, your speech will show it. A fig must have a, a fig tree at its source. A grape must have a vine at its source. An olive must have an olive tree at its source. And that brings us that brings us right back to where we started today. Get this in your mind. You're not going to get here to this with human reasoning. You've got to have spiritual reasoning with this. You've got to have a biblical understanding. Here. True believers will be revealed in their speech. They absolutely will be. And true believers must be. Both those things have to happen simultaneously. And they do. And we're right back to that tension. That's sovereignty responsibility, the whole thing. On the one hand, he's saying, if you are a Christian, this is how you will be. And at the same time, if you are a Christian, this is how you must be. While he's saying it is true, at the same time, he's calling us to be sure that it is true. It's never going to be perfect. You have to work with it. But both of those things exist together. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. I wonder if James had this passage in mind when he wrote what he wrote. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. Simply put, a true believer speaks with a tongue that is under you getting that? And when you have things coming out of your mouth that ought not to be coming out of your mouth, what is it that you do then? Repent. Confess it to God. Tell Him you're sorry. And then continue the work daily of controlling your tongue. With the days that you have left, they God gives you on this earth. It's a lifelong process. 
that we will do, and that we must do. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for James. What a sobering, convicting passage of Scripture yet again in the use of our time. The more every one of us is guilty, starting with me right at the very top in the first place. Uh, just very, very convicted. But Lord James has given us the gold standard. And we have seen a change if we have come to faith in Christ. We definitely have, but we know we all have continual work to do in this area. So I pray that we would we would just hear this word of God today, this 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 passage from James, Lord, I pray it would just penetrate deep into us that we wouldn't forget it when we walk out of the building. We remember it in the week ahead, in the weeks ahead, in the months ahead, in the years ahead, that how important it is to you that we control our time and we ask for the grace to be able to do that because apart from you, we can do nothing. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you for this time of worship. We pray that all we've done this day has brought you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're standing. We'll close by singing. Guidance.